Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And um, we're going to continue looking at uh, three touches of Lot's Daniel chapter 10. It's our review of 10, 11, and 12, Daniel's last vision. But we're going to be looking at the three touches of the everlasting gospel and probably getting into uh, chapter 11 itself in this, in this summary and review. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we invite your presence. We're so thankful, Lord, that you love us and care for us in spite of ourselves. And um, we pray for one another. You know that uh, the time that we are living in is a difficult time in this earth's history. And there's many things happening around us, but it's the things that are happening inside our hearts that are the most important and our minds as we contemplate your word, as we seek to reflect your character to those around us. May your Holy Spirit speak to hearts and instruct us and correct us and lead us into all righteousness. And we pray this and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so um, when we originally went through the... Uh, Daniel's last vision for the last year and a couple of weeks that we've been studying this. Uh, when we had gone through Daniel chapter 10, we never really addressed this in detail. So what I've written out here in this paper is um, uh, was written after we had studied it. It was more insights that, that we had gained, and then I looked at it. And then I was also having a discussion with someone on the internet over the understanding of Daniel chapter 10, um, had some phone calls with him or Zoom studies with him as well. He had some very different views, but that's sort of why I wrote this out because it was fresh in my mind at the time. So we haven't gone through this. So in this review, we're just reading what I've written in this paper commenting on it. When we get to chapter 11, it's going to be a little more cursory as we do the review, just kind of bringing up the highlights. So I say here, as we mentioned in verse 10, there are three touches in Daniel 10 in connection with the Mara vision. And now, one thing we had noted yesterday in Daniel 10, verse 16, uh, it's going to talk about the vision and, and the Strong's number in Esword is going to be uh, the wrong number. What is it? Four, four, five, seven, eight. It says instead of four, five, seven, nine. I think, um, which I'm going to address a little bit. Four, seven, five, eight instead of four, seven, five, nine. But anyway, so that is this number four, seven, five, nine, which is Mara, and instead of Mara, which is four, seven, five, eight. So that's so Mara is the looking glass vision. Um, so we're going to look at this first touch and then note some details. So this is the first time the touch happens. Therefore, I was left alone and saw this great vision, the Mara, and there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. Yet heard I the voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face, and my face toward the ground. And behold, an hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee and stand upright. For unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. With this revelation of Jesus Christ, Daniel's comeliness, his glory or view of himself is changed so that he sees his corruption, his sinfulness. This removes from him his strength or confidence in himself. He sees himself as he is by looking into the perfect law of liberty in the face of Jesus Christ. He is then in a deep sleep from the hand of Christ touches him. This touch sets Daniel upon his hands and knees. He is asked to understand the words of Gabriel and stand. We then see him standing, though trembling, in the sense of shuddering with fear. Okay, so so this is the first touch. Now, um, 
I can't remember how much detail we went into these touches, but we know that he gets touched. Uh, he gets touched in, in Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 9 and Daniel chapter 10. So there's other touches, which Gabriel is going to touch him, right? So well, we'll just read on here. I think I'd probably explain some of this. As a prophet, Daniel represents the, pe- the condition of God's people, a revelation of Christ, is our greatest need. We see here that this revelation comes through the prophetic word. It is not through our imagination, since our concept of God is flawed. We do not see him as he is. We love darkness because our deeds are evil. The light that shines from God's word is not welcome to human nature. It produces a fear, which if resisted, leads us further into the recesses of darkness. Yet if we respond to the glory of God and are drawn to him, in spite of our fear, yea, rather because of it, it will lead us to repentance and give entrance into his kingdom of light. For we know that it is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. There's no way that a sinner can behold the goodness of God and not fear. Any comments on that paragraph? Do people agree with what, what I wrote there? Okay. So assume you all well, understand. What's okay. that? All right. So okay. I'm going to ask you a question on your second sentence. Okay. You're saying a revelation of Christ is our greatest need. Mm-hmm. Yet what you're speaking of as far as this vision is not just a revelation of Christ. It's a personal revelation of Christ. Okay. Which of course is is implied there. Well, um, but yeah, but but yeah, I could put in there uh, personal, right? Okay. Because <clears throat> the whole problem that we're seeing right now within the church and within the movement mm-hmm. is the attitude is that all of this has to be corporate. Ah. It's a group attitude, and we have to be more specific. This has to be personal. Yes, because people think that they can sort of get in as a group. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and and that's one of the, the things I see is a great fault with what Jeff Pippinger is doing right now in regard to, um, you know, that we're now Philadelphia and not Laodicean. Right. Is he, he's just grouping us together like you're part of this group. Now you're Philadelphian. Right. It's, Agreed. Yeah, it it and, and and I think that's sort of been a tendency within the movement to see it as a group rather than what happens individually. And we could see that of course with uh, the organization that was happening and and uh you know just everything was tending towards this this sort of group identity instead of recognizing individually we are saved. That right. The, the 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 purpose of fellowship and organization is never for salvation, right? Okay. That that is not. It doesn't. It's you're not saved by an organization or a group or working together with other people. Those are things that are necessary for our character, right? And and the unity of effort is important in accomplishing a work. Right. So God unites the body together to accomplish things. But from a salvational point of view, without this personal revelation of Christ, then, you know, all you have is human machinery. And, you know, so you're, you know, to use a metaphor, you know, you're putting the cart before the horse, so to speak, because people, people want to skip this step. This is a difficult step. And, and this fear of God, right? And so that's where, you know, I was wondering, people are going to really ask about this, you know, that we are, if we respond to the glory of God or drawn to him in spite of our fear, and I say, yeah, the, rather because of it. So it is because of this fear. This fear can do two different things. It can drive us to God or away from God. It's the same fear, Right. Right. That light, it's the same light. It can it can draw people to it 
or it can cause, cause people to avoid it. To There's use, no difference in the light. To okay. use an adage, are you saying it's two sides of the same coin? Okay. Yeah, two different sides of the same coin. Yeah. You know, and so there's, it, it's some ways why some people respond to the light and are drawn to it and some resist the light and flee from it is really part of the mystery of godliness and the mystery of iniquity, right? Like the question is, why do some people respond and why do some people, why are some people repelled? And in some ways, everyone is both drawn to the light and also uh, repelled from the light. In a sense, everyone is, it's not, you know, just some people are just drawn to light completely and some people are just reject. All of us go through both of these experiences, right? In, it's impossible not to avoid the light. All of us naturally avoid the light. But yet we also are naturally, in a sense, maybe supernaturally drawn to the light. So, you know, there's it's it's not like good people are drawn to the light and bad people, you know, resist the light. Because we're, we're all sinners, right? So we're all bad people. None of us are good. So it, it's always one of the things that puzzled me the most is why are some drawn and some repelled ultimately? But, but the point is, this is a personal revelation of Christ. This is what has to happen. So that's that's the first touch. And so he goes through this process, right? He's He sees his sinfulness. He falls on his face in a deep sleep. You know, he then, you now it says here, the hand of Christ touches him. And, and the question really has to do with who's touching him, right? Um, and that's that's not always clear. So it's one of the things that I was trying to sort out. So in the second touch, we see something else happening to Daniel. As Gabriel announces his mission, now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. That's, um, that's Daniel 10, 14. Daniel turns his face towards the ground and becomes silent. Take note of what occurs next. And behold, one like the similitude of the sons of men, Christ, Michael, touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spake and said unto him that stood before me, O my Lord, by the vision of my sorrows are turned upon me. By the vision, my sorrows are turned upon me, and I have retained no strength. For how can the servant of this my Lord talk with this my Lord? For as for me, straightway there remained no strength in me, neither is there breath left in me. And that's Daniel 10, verse 16 to 17. Um, if the first touch leads us to repentance, the second allows us to express our total dependence upon God. This is sanctification. We live the Christian life not by our strength, but by the power of God. And we must note the parallel here to Isaiah 6. So we're familiar with Isaiah 6, this um, in the year that King Uzziah died, 758 BC. I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With twain he did cover his face. With twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. One cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then, ends, then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphim unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. While Isaiah had already been prophesying in the days of Uzziah, he is now given a view of the heavenly sanctuary, beholding the mediatorial work of Christ. He sees his deficiency. Soon the Assyrians will bring their power upon the cities of Judah. While this vision is given 16 years prior to chapter 7, its connection to the message of that chapter is to be noted. 
the proclamation of the 65-year prophecy of Isaiah 7-8, which marks the start of the prophetic mirror of the Kazon vision, must be preceded by a revelation of Jesus Christ. Daniel 12 is illustrating this for the time of the end in both 1798 and 1989. Without this revelation and proclamation, we cannot receive the third touch. So there's there's lots here to sort of unpackage um, in, in this second touch. Now, we believe here that the one touching Daniel is Christ. Do we, we all agree with that? based on what we see there. So when it talks about <clears throat> one like the similitude of the sons of men touched my lips. So do we agree that that's Christ? Well, Elamite, she said that the first touch was Christ. Yeah, yeah. So, so we say here in Daniel 10, the one touching him is Christ, right? That, that we're, we're agreed because Ellen White says it, but but we agree that that this these touches are Christ. But in Daniel chapter eight, when Daniel is touched, he's going to be touched by Gabriel. Right. And, and chapter nine. I'm just going to go there here. Just uh, so in, in Daniel 18, 818. Now, as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground and he touched me and set me upright. So that's in Daniel chapter 8. Um, do we agree that that's Gabriel that touches him? Because it says um, there's going to be a voice saying, uh, um, I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. So Christ is going to say to Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision in chapter 8. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was unafraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. Now, as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground, and he touched me and set me upright. So we would agree that it's Gabriel who touches him in Daniel chapter 8. And in Daniel chapter 9, verse 21, it says, Yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me at, at about the, the time of the evening oblation. So Gabriel is going to touch him in Daniel chapter 9. So, so we can see that this, this, this ties these together. So chapter 8, chapter 9, and chapter 10 are going to have Daniel being touched. But in Daniel chapter 10, it's going to be Christ, not Gabriel. So, so we've never really addressed this in detail before. Right? So in 10.10, in 10, and behold, a hand touched me and set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. So, so that's going to be the first touch, and that's going to be Christ. So, so Stephen, you're saying Ellen White clearly marks that that's Christ that touches him in 10.10? 10? Uh, yes, you had read it earlier on. What's that? I didn't catch what you said. Yes, she had, uh, you had. You had read it one of her uh, earlier on, just a uh, few lines up. Okay, I had read it. <laughs> I go further up. I don't. I didn't see where I had a spirit of prophecy statement. All right. Okay. Maybe it was just yourself then. I thought it was. That's, yeah, Michael. that's just me that's saying that, right? So I put right. here Christ or Michael touched. Touched him. Yeah. So I, I so I wasn't clear if there's a spirit of prophecy statement saying, you know, who touched him. So <clears throat> but I, I'm saying that it's Christ touching him in Daniel chapter 10. So if we had a spirit of prophecy quote, that would be good. Now you definitely uh, when what we about, get, uh, that Daniel ten thirteen. Yeah, so Daniel 10, 13 says, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one in 20 days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. So so we know Gabriel is talking, right? Yeah. Is that what you're pointing at? Yeah, so we know. And, and that's where it becomes unclear yeah. in these passages, exactly who's doing what. Because we know Gabriel is talking, but then we we know that that Daniel is being touched. And, and and this is all in connection with being made to understand something, right? Just as it is in, in uh, chapter 8. What? 
Angela. Yes, I, I agree with you there. It's just that, you know, we're getting a translation here now. What is, who is that he, for example, you know? Is that Christ? Right. Is that Gabriel? <laughs> I don't know, read Daniel 10, 13, it sounded like it, like it was Gabriel who was yeah, helped Gabriel's, by Michael. And I think Gabriel's doing most of the speaking, but but I believe that the touching is is done by Christ. Okay, so that, that's the way that I take take this. Um, okay, so let's re re read what I wrote. We can go back over here. The third touch is the empowering of God in the human life. Uh, in complete obedience to all of God's command, Daniel is strengthened. This is glorification. Christ's character perfectly reproduced in his people. You should also note that Daniel is touched by Gabriel in Daniel 8, verse 18 and 9, 21. In chapter 8 is the context of the kazone, so I go back to that, which we already looked at, um, at least discussed, right? And then uh, the angel will go on to explain that symbolism of the vid, or explain the symbolism. Probably should always read what I wrote. The symbolism of the vision which he just experienced. However, at the end, he does not understand the relation between the kazone and the Mara vision of the evening, morning, or 2300 days. First, he must understand the transition from literal to spiritual Israel, which is provided in Daniel 9, the 70 weeks. So then he's going to be touched again. While I, while, and whilst I was speaking, praying, and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, who I had seen in the Kazone vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. The Kazone vision is clearly a reference to the vision of Daniel 8, where the ram, goat, and little horn exist in the longer vision of the Kazone, of which the 2300 days are a part. So when I say it's the vision of 8, when it's talking about the Kazone there. While the 2300 days occurs in the time of the ram, Medo-Persia. It does not include all of Persian history. It does not begin when Babylon falls or even in Daniel's day. The events that are to commence the 2300 days are not given until Daniel 9, some 19 years after the vision of chapter 8, and mark a starting point that is 82 years after the fall of Babylon. Still, without uh, an understanding of the Kazon vision, there's not there's no way for Daniel to know how far um, into the future that the 70 weeks and the 2300 days will commence. So, so Daniel needs to be given this understanding, right? Why is the explanation of Daniel 8 given in such a piecemeal fashion? Um, let us note some details to consider. Daniel 8, like chapter 7, describes the pagan nation's as animals, though instead of wild beasts, these are clean animals. However, we should note that they are not fit for sacrifice and that they have deformities. We know as well that paganism is a counterfeit of the sacrificial system given by God. Further, though Daniel in chapter 8 has his vision about 20 years before the end of the Babylonian captivity, he is taken in vision to Susa in Persia, we suggest, at the time of the the 2300 days is to commence. So I'm going to put my comma on this side. Because the we suggest is this next part. He is transported some 100 years into the future, yet has he has no reference frame to know exactly when he is. In chapter 9, Gabriel gives him the answer in that he gives the starting point, which he had been brought to some 20 years earlier. Daniel's last vision ties all of these periods back to the point of reference that Daniel can appreciate. As noted, he cannot know how far these events in the future will be. He can understand, however, the connection to the continual transgression or the daily, which is paganism. While in chapter 8, there is a question asked by the angel regarding the length of the daily and the abomination of desolation, the only answer given is that it ends with a period of 2300 years. More specifically, the answer to the sanctuary is given, but not to the host, right? So in chapter eight, he's given this period of 2300 years, but he doesn't understand the connection of the 2520 
the Kazon, and how that fits together. So you can see in Daniel chapters 10 to 12, Daniel's last vision, this actually gives the whole key to understanding the prophetic periods, right? So Daniel is then going to understand how far in the future all of this is going to occur because he can, he now has something to anchor it to, right? Because he can now see there's the two 1260s. He can see the 2300 days. He can see the 70 weeks and he can see how they all fit in. So he can see the whole prophetic mirror once he's, he's done. Does, does that make sense? So, you know, and I have to express this somehow in the paper. So the idea is that you have in chapter eight, he's going to be touched by Gabriel. In chapter nine, he's going to be touched. But then you have the three touches in Daniel chapter 10. Can we see that these are all connected to understanding prophecy and particularly the prophetic periods? So when we talk about a revelation of Christ, when we talk about you know, within Christianity, you know, we need to focus upon Christ, the doctrine of Christ, 1919, um, you know, Prescott. You know, people have this idea that we can talk about Christ apart from the, the prophecies. Is that possible? To know Christ, to see Christ, to have a revelation of Christ apart from the prophetic periods? Not according to the book of Revelation, I would think. Uh... This is a revelation of Jesus Christ. Yeah. So, so the thing that that I guess puzzles me, or we, we can we can sort of struggle with in as Seventh Day Adventists as Christians is this yeah, this whole idea question. that we need to know about Christ. Yeah, William. I'm sorry, I'm sorry Theodore, but so, yeah. um, First Peter, First Peter one nineteen to twenty. One, I think, tells you that you can't have Jesus without the prophets. Yeah, so First Peter 1. First Peter 1, chat, um, verse 19 to 20. I think you're talking about Second Peter. Second Peter 1, 19 to 21. Yeah, it probably is Second Peter. Yeah, yeah, Second Peter. Yeah, so this, this in section in Second Peter where it talks about uh, starting verse 16, for we have not followed cunningly devised fables, but we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, um, when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For we received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. So this is, he's talking about the Mount of Transfiguration. So Peter, James, and John were there. They saw, uh, you know, Moses and Elijah, right? They heard the voice of God saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, right? We're all familiar with that. And then he says, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. So What's more sure than hearing a voice from heaven, seeing, you know, being eyewitnesses? What's more sure than that? Prophecy, right? So if we see something and hear something, even if we touch it, something that's more sure is prophecy. Because our subjective experience is not as certain as the objective measure of prophecy. Right? So we can see how this Amen. is important. Right? Amen. Yeah. Because most people live in a subjective sort of Christian experience. They're going to talk about, you know, what they experienced, what they felt. And, and we know that the human heart's deceptively wicked. Right? It's deceitfully wicked. It deceives us. We can imagine that we are following God. And, and that's why, you know, for me, I, I need something objective by which I can judge myself. And, of course, God's word is objective. 
It's something outside of me. God is objective. He's the only objective viewer of this world that exists. We're not objective. This is where I see Revelation seminars being unique and successful in evangelism, more so than a flight of feeling and an emotional coming to the front sort of thing. Yeah, the revival type things. And, yeah. and, and the church has moved away from revelation seminars more to, you know, self-help seminars of various kinds. That's true. Right. Yeah. Yeah. How to deal with your finances, which is to give your money to the church. And, you know, then you'll be rich or, you know, how to stop smoking or cooking and different things, you know, marriage seminars, all these types of things which is not the gospel, right? And Christianity isn't. Uh, I remember back in the 1970s, it was this born-again advertising campaign put on by, I don't know which churches did this, maybe churches grouped together, but, you know, it's, you know, basically if you're born again, you're going to have a happy marriage and you're going to have good finances. And, you know, your life in this world is going to be so much better if you're born again. Nothing really about the cross and the sacrifice that we have to make uh, to be a Christian, you know. Um, so Christianity, whether the worldly Christianity or Adventism, which is really worldly Christianity, tries to appeal to our human nature to attract us. It, it avoids the gospel because the gospel is a cross. And, and that's why there is a sort of revival happening of Christianity that's focusing upon our personal cross, uh, we can see that with Dr. Jordan Peterson, right? I know he's going to have a book coming out, you know, Those That Struggle with God, dealing with, you know, Jacob's struggle. Um, and how, the, and, but I've seen in his presentations that there's this idea, you know, that we, we have to become like Christ. It's very unusual whether that's going to continue or it's going to be um, this whole movement be subverted by. Uh, satanic Christianity, which I think it probably will for the most part. So there's two things happening. Obviously, Satan is working and, and God is working. So there's the great controversy is being worked out in this world right now. But I believe it's part of what happens in the end times, that there's going to be a true revival and a false revival. And the true will lead to the prophecies as an objective measure. So so we believe for God's people that these prophecies are important. They're not just some secondary thing. They actually are these touches. This understanding of prophecy is an understanding of Christ. It is a revelation of Jesus Christ. And a lot of people would not agree with that within Adventism. They would look at this as a type of fanaticism. Okay. <clears throat> So when we look at Daniel 8.13, then I heard one saint speaking and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake. Now, the certain saint we know is Palmoni, right? The wonderful number. How long shall be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Daniel 11.31 and 12.11 address the transition between the daily and the abomination of desolation in more detail. It is the time periods in Daniel 12 that allow Daniel to see the extent of the prophetic periods. He now sees the full scope of the prophetic periods, which terminate nearly 2,500 years beyond his day. We can see why he is being encouraged that his prophecies will have their place even though their fulfillment is so far in the future. Right. Nearly 2,500 years. Well, it depends how you look at that. It's just kind of rounded off. So we looked at verse 20 to 21. Then he said, um, then said he, knowest thou wherefore I am come unto thee? And now, so he basically, that's a rhetorical. He said, now you basically know. And now I will return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grisha shall come. But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. And there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. Right. So 
he's he's going to um in these last verses verses of chapter 10 which we often don't really connect right that is we read these chapters separately he's going to show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth now in this moment we have understood that uh to be applied to uh these what's going to happen in chapter 11 right and he says there's none that holdeth with me in these things that is gabriel's talking here but michael your prince so christ and gabriel and what does it mean holdeth with me in these things it's it's not an expression that we generally use how would we understand this because it is it is more an idiomatic expression in hebrew would it be to um hold the same belief or position well, yes, I, I would think it more relates that understands it, right? That we both uh, grasp this. That, yeah, right. Yeah. No one, no one moment. has, no one knows it in depth as Christ does. No right. one can yeah. reveal it to us as Christ can. Yeah, yeah. No one has a full grasp of what this all means except me and Christ. Okay. Amen. Um, Okay. And as far as, you know, obviously that would include, I would believe, other angels, obviously not the father. Um, uh, but, you know, definitely no other person is going to understand these things. So so Michael and I are the ones who fully grasp this. So why is it that we would have this angel Gabriel who has such a... Uh, a conception of these prophecies. Why, why don't all the angels just understand it? Why is there this sort of specialist, let's say, expert? Where does Gabriel stand? Well, he's next to Christ. Okay, but Gabriel, is Gabriel also not represented by one of the two angels at the mercy seat? I don't know. Is that something that we can establish with certainty that that Gabriel ends up uh, replacing Satan? Is he not the covering cherub that replaced our adversary? Yeah, that's the question. So how do we establish that? I mean, I, I've heard that. I don't know how I would prove it to anyone. Stephen might have an answer. Yeah, I think uh, El might wrote. El might has uh, implied okay. that. Okay, so she says it somewhere. Okay. So. Okay, so if that's the case, and 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 you know, I've heard it, but I just I haven't personally seen the statement, or at least remember seeing the statement. Maybe it was shown to me, maybe I read it, but it just you know I never picked up on it. But but I've heard that. So okay, so we have now. Remember this. This has a lot of symbolism attached to it. Right. So if we think about this covering cherub um, and, and this conflict with with, um, you know, between Michael, you know, who is the chief of all the angels. And we have Satan, who is one of the covering cherubs. But now he's no longer is. Right. So Gabriel's taking his place. Would it have something to do with in understanding prophecy? Is it something to do with understanding not just Christ and God and knowing him, but also understanding Satan's motives and plans in some way. Maybe that's a bit too speculative, but but that, that this can't be understood by everyone. That is, the angels all cannot have the same understanding, right? That there must be something, even in heaven, in the angels' experience that differentiates them. They're not all just the same. Right. They're just not they're not an army of a bunch of, uh, you know, drones. It, it's something to think about. But, you know, how, how we could explain it, I don't know. particularly. After directing a rhetorical question at Daniel, do you do you now understand? Gabriel tells Daniel that he will return to continue working upon the heart of Cyrus, fighting against Satan's devices to thwart God's plans for Israel. Satan also has plans to have Greece involved. We should note that uh, 8269 SAR, that's the word that refers to a military commander, that is the prince of 
Grisha. Some speculate that the Prince of Grisha here referred to as Alexander. We do not take that position. Gabriel says that he has something to show Daniel, which is noted in the scripture of truth. It is the knowledge that Gabriel and Christ both share what is withheld from others. That's a bad typo. Okay. So now we're dealing with uh, the line of the Persian kings. In the third year, so that's 536, um, which we, we have here. So when we're looking at this, so we're looking at Daniel chapter 11. We know that when we went through this, we went through the historical application. We established that historical application. And then we also have a present truth application, which we put in red. And, and we're not going to go through this in detail. We've been through it many times before. We're just going to do a quick sort of overview of this. So what we saw is that there's this line of the Persian kings. And, and this was really the main focus of, of this study when, when we started out, right? Because we're going to look at Daniel chapter 11. We're going to address uh, Colin's uh, suggestion that we could take these kings of Persia and we could line them up with uh, the presidents of the United States, which we had been doing, but that we could uh, move further past Trump because this is just going to talk here about Trump, you know, being the fourth in this count, right? The, the fifth, if you're going to look at the other count in the riddle. And um, so then he's going to say, well, you know, who's going to come after uh, uh, Trump? Well, we, we have Biden, right? So when we had focused upon this originally, we're going to look at the, so, so we have this kind of problem. Okay. So the problem was we had addressed uh, the presidents of the United States in context. Now, why did we even look at the presidents of the United States back in 2000? 15. Why, why did we even deal with Trump as Dean Zerks? Does anybody remember the history of, of how that happened? Where, where did we start in 2015 that led us to uh, making a prediction about Trump becoming the president of the United States? People remember? We were using, we were using the kingdoms of uh, Bible prophecy. Well, okay, it even goes back to 2014. Yeah. So it wasn't about the kingdoms of Bible prophecy. It, it, it went back to 2014. Um, the first study that Jeff presented on that was dealing with the number four. And it was dealing with the kings of, um, of Judah in connection with the four seven times. So back in 2000, well, I guess it actually be 2013. So it's going to start there. We're going to have the four seven times. We're going to have Manasseh, Jehoiakim, uh, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah as these four. But within that, it's going to happen within the seven, the last seven kings of Judah, right? So you're going to have Manasseh, but then it's going to be followed by Ammon, and then Josiah, and then Jehoahaz, and then Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah, right? So... So that four, seven times, there's going to be seven kings of Judah. And, and this is going to look at, you know, the last seven kings of Judah, the first seven kings of Judah, the first seven kings of Israel. And then it leads to, along the, the way, we come to a study of uh, the, the three decrees, I guess, basically. So we're going to be looking at these kings of Persia, right? So these kings of Persia, become understood. And in 2015, Jeff is now going to note this connection between uh, these this list here in Daniel chapter 11, dealing with the kings of Persia, right? So the kings of Persia that are going to be dealt with here uh, are not going to go all the way up to Artaxerxes, right? It's just going to start, it's going to go up to Xerxes, and then it's going to skip to Alexander. So, you know, not everybody was a part of the movement back then and what was happening. Um, so some of this you just know because, you know, we've studied it later. So you can kind of see how that would have developed. So in 2000, the end of 2015, the beginning of 2016, 
we're going to be dealing with this Trump prediction. So when Stephen and Heidi and I are there in Arkansas in 2016, we're going to be dealing with, you know, before Trump gets elected, you know, the idea is Trump going to be this fourth, right? So we had lined these up. You know, we lined up Darius the Mead with Reagan. Um, and then says there shall yet. Uh, and, and of course, then we're going to have Cyrus is going to be uh, the king at this time, right? And uh, so he's going to line up with Bush the first. So there's going to be three that stand up. Cambyses, False, Smyrtus, and Darius. That's going to be Clinton, Bush the second, and Obama. And then the fourth which is Xerxes, that's going to be Trump. But we never moved past that. So we'd say Trump is the last president of the United States. And the way that Jeff dealt with this is he says, well, Alexander is also symbolizing Trump. So the idea here um, is that we're going to have this. So this is what this whole struggle was about within this movement. Was Jeff correct about Trump being the last president of the United States? When this movement after in, in 2020, after the failure of the July 18, 2020 prediction, you had FFA with uh, Bronwyn at the head, you know, basically renouncing what we had predicted, that it was error. And with the election of Biden, um, they were still trying to hold on to Trump is going to still be the last president. But with the election of Biden, they basically abandoned uh, everything that we had taught, right? So that they believe that that prediction had failed. Trump wasn't the last president of the United States. And so um, on December 6th, right, they write their declaration or publish their declaration. They ban some of us from their WhatsApp group. And then uh, we're going to have some events that follow that they obviously aren't going to really pay attention to. We're going to have the bombing of Nashville. 187 days after uh, the prediction, right, of that when it was published. And then we're going to have uh, the insurrection on January 6, 2021. And again, these all become part of this structure. So it shows that, that we were correct, but not correct in exactly when things would happen, but we were correct as to the dates. This was part of a structure that was built on prophecy. And then, of course, 187 days after July 18th, uh, you know, they're going to sell uh, the School of the Prophets for 18.7% below the asking price. You know, so there's all these different things that happen. Of course, we have another count. The way that we can count it is we can also have Biden inaugurated on the 187th day. Um, right. So those are two a day apart. So, so all these different things happen. Um, so, so later on, December 25th, 2021, Colin is going to make a prediction that Trump's going to become president again. And so he's going to continue on with these, these kings, right? So we had this understanding of the kings of Persia, but we never moved beyond Trump because Trump was the last president, which, which really didn't make any sense, right, to me. Not that Trump's not the last president. I, I actually still believe that Trump is the last president of the United States. Um, that he was. The United States is something happened on January 6th uh, that is connected to, at least in a typical way, the falling of the, the Republican horn. Right. So there's still more we need to understand on this issue and how we apply it. But we, we've done a lot of study on it. But that's what's going to be addressed as we continue going through Daniel chapter 11. So we, we, we address this. We, we have this conflict between me and Colin, which was turned into a conflict that wasn't really a conflict, but turned into a conflict over the issue about Alexander. So we could say that there's no possible way that Alexander can be um, Trump. Trump is not typified by Alexander. And why would we say that? What, what are some reasons? So when a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will, why do we know that's not Alexander? 
or why, why do we know that's not Trump? It's Alexander. What was our conclusion? How did we address these prophecies? Now, you can see, of course, we have an application here. We're going to say it's the USSR. All right. So, so what do we do with these when we get to Greece in Daniel chapter 11? How, how are we taking these, these verses? So we're, we're going to say that Persia typifies the United States, right? Can Greece typify the United States? If it can't, why can't it? Like, what does Greece typify? So if Persia typifies the United States, Persia typifies the two-horned beast of Revelation chapter, chapter 13, right? And Greece represents the world. Yeah, Greece represents the globalists. So, so we can see in the time of Xerxes, there's going to be this battle between the globalists, right, Greece, and Medo-Persia. Medo-Persia represents the United States. Now, we're going to move then. We're not going to go in this list of kings to, you know, Artabanus and Artaxerxes and Darius, you know, the second and Artaxerxes the second and things like that, right? Darius, whichever Darius he is. You know, there's going to be these other kings of Persia that are going to continue on. Uh, we're not going to address those. This prophecy is going to move to Greece. So it moves to Greece with Alexander, which is still quite a bit after Xerxes, right? So long time after Xerxes. So, you know, a couple hundred years almost, right? I think it's close to that. So it does this for a purpose, a reason, right? Because it's going to be addressing the United States, the, the false prophet, and then it's going to address Greece. Now, Greece is the world, right? That's the UN, that's the globalists. It, it's also the dragon power, right? And then we're going to have, after Greece, we're going to have Rome, right? So the beast, Right. So you're going to have the, the false prophet, the dragon and the beast. They're going to be presented here in Daniel chapter 11. So there's no way that you can have Alexander the Great representing the United States. It must represent in our time uh, the dragon power, which is first going to be the Soviet Union, which then is going to fall. And that is going to move to the U.N., that characteristic. Right. So the U.N. becomes this globalist power because we have that characteristic move from France to the Soviet Union to the U.N. Does that make sense to people? Anybody have questions about that? So that's how we address this issue of Greece. And then we, we go through all of this, this historical understanding, which really doesn't differ uh, in any major way from what had been understood by Uriah Smith or the pioneers. It's pretty clear history. We're going to have uh, an agreement there. And then what we're going to do is we're going to apply this history in our time, the, ap the application, the present truth application, to all these things leading up to um, the fall of the Soviet Union and 9-11 into our history, all the way up to these uh, to the present time. So that's what the present truth application is going to do. Uh, so we're going to see all of this, this past history is typifying what we have been going through in our time. And, and we use all kinds of symbols, right? Symbols of, of dates and, and uh, being tied with the spans of time that come from these Hebrew numbers. So like, for instance, uh, the four winds of heaven, you add up the Hebrew numbers, 702, 7307, 8064, uh, you get 16,073, which we take as days, and we're going to count that um, from, it's going to go to December 25th, 2023, all the way back to uh, December, I think it's going to be from December 24th, 79, it's kind of a bit unclear there, because we got uh, that's going to be that period of time of the Soviet-Afghan war. So we have established some things about the verses, 
And then we're going to find that these spans of time fit in with these Hebrew numbers, right? So I'm not going to go into detail on that. So we're going to have this battle over what's happening within this movement at the present time, what's happening in the United States, mostly at the present time, all being described about these battles uh, that are going on, not so much the battles, but the personal, uh, they're sort of, in, I guess, internal battles within Greece in the dividing up of Greece into the north and the south, right? So basically what you have is you have this, uh, uh, this, this kingdom being separated into the Ptolemaic Empire in the south and the Seleucid Empire in the north, right? So we, we can say there's these battles going on. They're going to be conquering these different territories, and there's going to be having some, some battles, but it's really going to focus on, once we get to the main battles, it's going to be the Battle of Raphia and the Battle of Paneum, right? These become the real focus of the battles between the king of the north and the king of the south described in that sense, right? So there's there's some struggles and, um, you know, agreements and so forth that are going on between these powers. But until we get to the Battle of Raphia, we don't really have what we call the Battle of the King of the North against the King of the South or the King of the South against the King of the North. Does that make sense? So in Daniel 11, 11, when it says the King of the South, shall be moved with collar uh, and shall come forth and fight with him, even the king of the north, and he shall set forth a great multitude, but the multitude shall be given into his hand, right? That is going to be the battle of Raphia, right? And, and that becomes the first major battle between north and south. Now, why do we say that? Like, there's other... Battles and fights that have been going on. Why is that the focal point? The Battle of Raphia. And then followed by the Battle of Paneum. Right? So, so we have all these wars going on. right? This is in the Fourth Syrian War. But why does this become the focal point? The Battle of Raphia, the Battle of Paneum. Daniel 11, verse 40, A and B, are being typified by these two battles. Right? So 1798 is typified by the Battle of Raphia. That's where the king of the south conquers the king of the north, right? So these are the first time like they've had territorial skirmishes, but this is more a conquering, right? But then the king of the north is going to conquer the king of the south in the Battle of Paneum, and that's going to be the conquering of the king of the south. That is, that's the end of the king of the south, so to speak. I mean, it's... Not completely the end, but but you understand what I'm saying? Does that make sense to people? And that's going to be typified by what happens in 19... That's going to typify what happens in 1989. And any questions about that? This is the main thing that we, we came to understand about Daniel chapter 11 in regard to Raphi and Paneum and how it connects to Daniel 11 verse 40. So everybody understands that fully? Okay. You know, so... It's good if people make some comments if you have any kind of questions, because somebody watching the summary may not completely follow this. Now, after the or the Battle of Paneum, or in some ways connected to it, we're going to then have the papacy arise, right? Well, we're going to have Rome arise. But you understand what I'm saying? So Rome is going to exalt itself to establish the vision. So this becomes, um, for some people, this becomes a divide in what and how we understand Daniel 11 from then on, for as far as the evangelicals are concerned, right? They're going to look be looking at Atticus Epiphanes, but we're going to see that this is about, about Rome, right? So when we get in those times, there shall many stand up against the king of the south, also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision. Now, we found some very interesting details uh, symbolically represented in this verse. 
so we know that, of course, Rome exalting itself to establish the vision uh, becomes fundamental to our understanding of Daniel chapter 11 and, and to the rise of the papacy, Rome here, literally, but papacy in our time. Because um, the papacy exalts itself to establish the vision as, as well in our history. But in that history, it's going to be pagan Rome, right? Not papal Rome. But when we looked at this expression, uh, the sons of the breakers, we could see if we took the Hebrew numbers 11, 11, 2, 1, and 6, 5, 3, 0, and added them together, we get 7, 6, 5, 1, which is the Hebrew number of the word Sheba in Leviticus 26. So the sons of the breakers of thy people, or the sons of the robbers of thy people, however you want to translate it, um, the King James leaves out the sons, right? It just says the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision. It just completely leaves out a Hebrew word. Now, now, why is that? Like, why do you think they would just say the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves and not the sons of the robbers of thy people? Like, I mean, the question has different levels. I mean, why would the translators just ignore a word? But is there some reason prophetically, symbolically, that they ignore this word uh, that becomes important for us. Perhaps it was to be unveiled in our time, so God hid his hand. Okay. And so God, God hid it well, with his hand. Yeah. So, so we have seen this many times where something is hidden in some way in Scripture and that, the, that God does this until his hand is removed. And and that is God's not trying to mislead us, right? It's not like he's he's trying to deceive people, um, you know. But there is a way in which things could not be understood. That is, they wouldn't appreciate them until a certain time, and so at that time, God allows us to see something that couldn't have been appreciated earlier, right? So the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision didn't affect our interpretation as far as that this is wrong, right? Now, uh, when we look at the sons of the robbers, how, how does that, just, just, just that meaning of that affect it? So who are the robbers of thy people initially? Rome. No, no, the robbers of thy people. Rome is the sons of the robbers of thy people. And you're saying Babylon. Babylon, right? Babylon is the robbers of thy people, right? How, how do we establish that? When did when did Babylon rob? And what is that referencing? Leviticus twenty six twenty two. I will also send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children and destroy your cattle and make you few in number. That's Daniel's captivity. So the robbers of thy people is Babylon. Right. And we have already connected the 666 years between uh, the, 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 the siege in 597 B.C. and the siege in 70 A.D., 666 years. Uh, but the robbers of that people is Babylon. So Babylon's going to be uh, that's Assyria is going to take Manasseh captive and carry him to Babylon and then Neo-Babylonian Empire is going to, in the second seven times, it's going to come and take Daniel captive, right, and his friends and, and some other young people, right? So he's that's the robbers of thy people, is Babylon. So the sons of the robbers of thy people are the ones that are going to inherit that characteristic. Is Media Persia the robbers of thy people? Do they take the Jews captive? I don't know about that, Angela. She just asked it. The sons parallels the harlot daughters of Rome. I'm not sure. But anyway, the question is, Medo-Persia doesn't take, they, they don't take them captive. They actually free them, right? Does Greece take the Jews captive? Are they a robber of thy people? No, right? No, they're not. Right. But is Rome, the sons of the robbers of thy people, is it going to take the Jews captive again? Yes, right? That's what's going to be shown in Daniel chapter 11, is that after the Jews 
are, are freed first from captivity by Persia. They have their temple established. I mean, they're still going to be dominated by Greece, right? There's going to be, obviously, uh, you know, that's going to happen. But they're not going to be taken captive, carried away or anything like that. Uh, but we are going to see then with Rome, they're going to be taken captive. And eventually they're going to be scattered, the diaspora, right? So that's going to happen under Rome. So, so we can see how Rome has to be the sons of the robbers of my people. It's the one that inherits that characteristic through the connection between Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. Okay, so this becomes a really important point. And it's tied to the seven times because you take sons of the robbers and it's going to give you, you add those numbers together, you get the 7651 Sheba, right? So, and they're going to establish the vision. So we know that um, Daniel is, is to understand the vision, the kazon, that's Daniel 10, verse 14, right? So it says in Daniel 10, 14, um, now I'm come to you to make thee understand what shall, what shall be in all thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision, the kazon is for many days. And then in a Daniel 11, 14, and those times shall, shall many people, shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also the sons of the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the kazon, but they shall fall. So here he is now for the first time in Daniel 11 being given how the, the, the kazon is going to be established. So that's what he's being made to understand is the kazon. And it's the understanding of the robbers of thy people, the sons of the robbers of thy people, exalting themselves to establish the kazon that becomes this key. Right. So this becomes extremely important for us understanding these prophecies in Daniel 11. It, because this is really about the kazone. That's what's being explained in Daniel 11. That that changes everything. It it answers to the problems of Smith when he tries to address Turkey. Um, it explains, of course, the prophetic periods in Daniel chapter 12 and how we understand Daniel 12 verse 7 is talking about 1260 years for the scattering of the power of thy holy people. Not that's not addressing the 1260 for the papalism, but for paganism, right? So, so these become keys to understanding Daniel chapter 11. So then we're going to deal with how this the this this uh, the Battle of Paneum, how it leads to ultimately um, the the pagan Rome becoming this power, becoming the king of the north, right? So it's going to subjugate Syria, become the king of the north. And then, and then we're going to have, so Rome under Pompey the Great will stand in the glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed. That's going to be the siege of Jerusalem in 63 BC, Right. And then we went through like these six Syrian wars and we put them on a line. The death of Alexander, the first, second and third Syrian war, the battle of Raffi and Paneum. We can see Raffi and Paneum line up with the formalization and the empowerment of the second angel's message. And then we dealt with the battle of Pydna, which is also June 22nd, 168 BC, 168, the number of hours in a week. It becomes a symbol. And um, and then we also dealt with the Soviet-Afghan war, and we put all these things on the line. So there's lots of details in here, which obviously we cannot go through um, in this quick summary. And so we, we went through uh, this whole history of dealing with these kings and the different dates, both of the kings of the north and the king of the south. And and now, so you can see when we when we went through this, just to you got verse 13, and then we did 14, 15, 16, and then we went through them again. So do you remember why we went through them again, why we list them twice? Like why we have 
these verses, we deal with the end of that kingdom. And then we, what, what did we do the second time? Does anybody remember why we went through these verses again? So we have a different interpretation in the present truth application, right? So we have one that deals with uh, the history leading up to the time of the end. And then we had another application of these verses. Let me see here. Where we're going to deal with, uh, okay, how, how did we do that? I'm trying to remember myself. Yeah, so this one's going to deal more with our history, the history of this movement. So it's going to be more present truth in, the, in its application in the red. But then we went through it again, dealing with a less present truth application, let's put it that way, dealing with the things leading up to the time of the end. So why did we do that? Anybody remember? This is a while, a while ago. We, we believe that, both applications are correct. What, Stephen? That was uh, Chowatu's application. Okay, so it was uh, whose application? Chowatu and Kimberly. They don't know the case. Okay, right, yeah. Yeah, so so there was a, an application of Chowatu and Kimberly. They had this application. So within the movement, there was a divergence on how to look at these verses. Okay? And so now, you know, and probably we should have looked a little bit more into exactly what Jeff said. Um, and but there was this this divergence that was happening within the understanding of Daniel chapter 11. And, and I'm not an expert in that area. Right. Because I wasn't really paying attention. Um, because I just felt that people were mixed up. Right. So I, and, and I didn't know enough to to sort through it at the time. But God can have uh, different interpretations of a passage in, in the in the sense of the present truth, as long as the historical application is correct, right? So we have to start with the same historical application, right? We're not going to interpret it historically as, well, you know, it can also be a Tychus Epiphanes, and it can also be this, and it can also be that, correct? That in the historical application, there is how that prophecy is fulfilled. Do we agree with that? Now, now there's some ways in which it can it can have a double fulfillment. That is, it can represent two things at the same time, but they're connected, right? But you can't have two contradictory applications historically. You can't say this prophecy was fulfilled this way, but it was also fulfilled later this other way, right? You have to say it was fulfilled this way. And we can make an application that is, it can be typical of something that happens later. Is that correct? Now we do. We know that there's a double application of prophecy and a triple application of prophecy in Lewis F. Weir's uh, material. But when we deal with that, that's there are some things that within themselves they have an application that applies to different times, like Elijah. Right? W when is Elijah? Fulfilled. Is it a trip? Can we make a triple application of prophecy with the prophecy of Elijah? Well, we have Elijah, John the Baptist, and then 144,000. And we also have Miller, right? Yes, he's a type of John the Baptist. Right, right. But but that John the Baptist is is connected to Elijah, right? So Miller, in a sense, is connected to Elijah, right? It's just a message that comes at a specific time to prepare for another message. Okay? Make sense? What, what about the destruction of Jerusalem? How would we look at when Jesus in you know, Matthew 24 and so forth is, is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem? Is that just to be applied to literally the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, like historically, or is Christ also dealing with the end of the world at the same time? And even the French Revolution as a type okay. of destruction of Jerusalem, maybe. Okay. But yeah, so we, we would say that there's the destruction of Jerusalem that's being addressed. Like, you know, 
Uh, you know, if you see armies compass to Jerusalem. But we also know that it applies to the end of the world. It's not that we're just making an application of it to the end of the world after we look at the historical fulfillment. But Christ is clothing in his language with the destruction of, the, of Jerusalem, the end of the world, right? But when we're looking at prophecy, when we're looking at Daniel chapter 11, we're understanding this historically there is only one historical application of Daniel chapter 11. But there is ways in which those things typify, even within that own hit, that history, just like Raphia and Paneum are going to typify Daniel 11 verse 40, right? So that's how we understood this. So we, we're going to go through this other application, and, and we can show this and establish this. Now, you know, things like, and, and there were so many little interesting details, which as I'm writing this out, because I've finished chapter 10, I haven't haven't begun working on writing out, Dan, you know, my explanations of Daniel chapter 11 from our studies. But, um, you know, this was this interesting thing where we took the lexical sum for Daniel 1116, which was 47,903. And we could count from July 18, 1870 to September 11th, 2001, that number of days. Um, now, of course, July 18, 1870, that's when they had the, the vote was taken. Um, 533 votes in favor and only two against, defining as dogma the infallibility of the Pope when speaking ex cathedra. So papal infallibility is connected here. And... And of course, that has to do with the understanding of the verse itself, right, in, in our time. So, so we had lots of things like that. I still have more charts to draw out. Then we're going to have, uh, it's going to go back over this history. So we're going to have this history dealing with Obama and Trump and the presidents of the United States when we make that application. And then it, it's, but it's going to go back to the, to it's going to go all the way up to the crucifixion of Christ. And then in verse 23, 24, it's going to go back and cover this history again, right? Because it's going to provide more detail. So this is a repeat and enlarge. And again, I'm not going to look at the detail of this, but the main thing that we saw is that the reason that the Jerusalem was destroyed, it's going to bring us back to the Roman Jewish league. So it's going to go back to this earlier history. And then it's going to show how that led to the destruction of Jerusalem. And then uh, it's also going to tie it to this, this 360 year prophecy, even for a time, right? So it's going to deal with the Battle of Actium and um, also the Battle of Pharsalus, right? So, so we said, in a sense, here we have like two different ways you can understand the verse. So it almost contradicts what I said earlier that there's one way. To understand it, but I think it's actually placed in this way to be understand in, understood in two different ways. Um, but they're related to each other, right? So it's not like like taking that uh, you know the robbers of thy people exalt themselves to establish the vision is both Rome and also a Tychus Epiphanes, right? Those would be incompatible. These aren't mutually exclusive; they're actually complementary. So we have this chart here where we have uh, these number of days uh, from the Battle of Pharsalus to the Edict of Milan, and then from the Battle of Actium to the, the removal of Constantinople uh, from the capital of, of Rome, from Rome to Constantinople, right? And we had all kinds of symbol symbolism in there with the numbers, with the texts uh, that show that this is, is connected. And then we also could connect that to 508. So we can see that this history of, of, of pagan Rome, uh, the 666 years of, of Miller's understanding, uh, how that ties in with, you know, 508 Roman Jewish League. And we tied this all the way back to other things as well. And then, and then we looked at, uh, can't even remember what this chart is. 
Yeah. So, so there's some things I'm going to have to go over. I'm going to have to watch some of these videos again. So anyway, that's where we got up to. And so tomorrow we're going to just look at the rest of this summary um, starting here in verse 25. So that's going to be dealing with uh, the end of Egypt, right? Being conquered by Rome and then how that relates to uh, the change from the daily to the abomination of desolation and these things that we've more recently covered. Any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Okay, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful, Lord, for the time that we've had this morning. We just ask for your continued presence as we go throughout this day. And as we pray that we can come back together tomorrow um, with clear minds and a greater understanding of your word. Help us in the battles that we face today. Strengthen us. Be with our family and friends. Um, we ask for your angels' care and protection. Bring us together again and uh, help us as we continue to, to study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.